So, good day everyone. So, we are the second presenter, the group 2. And together with my groupmates, allow us to give you an enrichment activity or game called four picks one word so we all know that we are all familiar with this game so we were going to present four pictures and you are going to identify what the picture is being portrayed so for active participation you are tasked to list down your answers in one foot sheet of paper and then take a picture in it and send it to my messenger so, without a further ado, let's begin to the first picture. So in relation to our activity, we will be talking about the processes and models of curriculum development. So for the desired learning outcome of this lesson, at the end of the discussion, the student must be able to explain and summarize the curriculum development processes and models. Before we will dig deeper to our discussion, allow me to introduce to all of you the speakers of today's discussion. The first speaker, Marifer Kane, the second speaker, Hara M. Swansing, and the last but not the least, Leia P. Waskin. To start with, what is curriculum? Curriculum is a dynamic process. In curriculum development, there are always changes that occur that are always intended for improvement. To do this, there are models presented to us from well-known curricularists like Ralph Tyler, Hilda Taba, Galen Saylor, and William Alexander, which would help clarify the process of curriculum development. So, we will know all of this well-known curricularist, but before that, let me ask you a question. Why is curriculum called a dynamic process? So, curriculum called a dynamic process, it is because curriculum is considered as the heart of any learning institution, which means schools cannot exist without curriculum. With its importance, in formal education, the curriculum becomes a dynamic process due to the changes that occur in our society. Curriculum development is a dynamic process involving many different people and procedures such as teachers, the curriculum, and many more. Development connotes changes which is systematic. So a change for the better means alteration, modification, or improvement of existing condition. So to produce positive changes, development should be purposeful, planned, and progressive. Usually, it is linear and follows a logical step-by-step -step fashion involving the following phases. So, first is the curriculum planning, the curriculum designing, the curriculum implementation, and the curriculum evaluation. 
So what is curriculum planning? So curriculum planning considers the school vision, mission, and goals. It is also include the philosophy of strong education and belief of the school. So all of this eventually be translated to classroom desired learning outcomes for the learners. The importance of curriculum planning is to develop well-coordinated quality teaching, learning, and assessment programs which builds students knowledge skills and behaviors especially in disciplines as well as the interdisciplinary and or physical personal and social capacities so next is the curriculum designing so curriculum designing is the way curriculum is conceptualized to include the selection and organization of content the selection and organization of learning experiences or activities and the selection of the assessment procedures and tools to measure achieve learning outcomes so a curriculum design also include the resources to be utilized in the statement of intended learning outcomes so the importance of curriculum design is to deepen learning and support students in gaining important core competences such as critical and creative thinking skillful communication and demonstrating care for self and others so next is the curriculum implementing so curriculum implementing in the classroom setting or the learning environment the teacher who is the facilitator of learning leads in outing into action plan which is based on the curriculum design curriculum implementing the plan that putting into action which is based on the curriculum design in the classroom setting or the learning environment the teacher is the facilitator of learning and together with the learners uses the curriculum as design guides to what will transpire in the classroom with the end in view of achieving the intended learning outcome so the implementing the curriculum is where action takes place it involves the activities that transpire in every teacher's classroom where learning becomes an active process so the last phase is the curriculum evaluating so curriculum evaluating determines the extent to which the desired outcomes have been achieved so this procedure is ongoing as in finding out the progress of learning or formative or the mastery of learning summative along the way evaluation will determine the factors that have hindered or supported the implementation it will also pinpoint where improvement can be made and corrective measures introduced the result of evaluation is very important for decision making of curriculum planners and implementers so furthermore evaluation helps build educational program assess its achievements and improve upon its effectiveness so evaluation plays an enormous role in teaching learning process it helps teachers and learners to improve teaching and learning so let's proceed to ralph tyler model or the four basic principles so who is ralph tyler so ralph tyler also known as tyler's rationale the curriculum development model emphasizes the planning phase so this is presented in his book basic principles of curriculum and instruction so he posited four fundamental principles which are illustrated as answers to the following questions so the first question what education purposes should schools seek to attain second what educational experiences can be provided that are likely to attain these purposes third how can these educational experiences be effectively organized 
And the last one, how can we determine whether these purposes are being attained or not? So, number one, what educational purposes should the school seek to attain? So, what aims, goals, and objectives should be sought? So, educational objectives become the criteria for selecting materials, content outlined, instructional methods developed, and test prepared. Rolf Tyler or the Tyler's Rationale. So, according to an article written in Fee Delta Kappan, Tyler concluded that the effectiveness of education can be improved and that the public call for education education reform is stimulus for improvement. So Tyler also believe that the learning takes place through the active behavior of the student. So in the other words, a student learns by doing, not what the teacher does. So how to write objectives? So objectives often incorrectly stated as activities the instructor must do rather than statement of change for students. So objectives are also listed as topics, concepts, or generalization. However, this approach does not specify what the students are expected to do with these elements such as apply them to illustrations in his or her life or unify them in a coherent theory explaining scientific deliberation. So, objectives can be indicated as generalized patterns to develop appreciation, to develop broad interest. So, these are more goals than objectives. So, it is necessary to specify the content to which this behavior applies. And objectives should specify the kind of behavior and the content area in which the behavior is to operate. So, for now, let's forward to the Tyler Rationally number 2. What educational experiences can be provided that are likely to attain these purposes? So, learning is said to take place through experiences that the learner has such as reactions the students make to the environment in which he, she is placed. That means... Education or educational experiences that the learner has had. The essential means of education are the experiences provided, not the things to which the student is exposed. So now may I introduce to you the criteria of selecting experiences. So are they valid in light of the ways in which knowledge and skills will be applied in out-of-the-school experiences? So, through experience that happen outside of the school, it helps students to gain new knowledge and skills and capabilities, including revealing to them new careers and opportunities they may not have known about otherwise. So, are they Feasible in terms of time, staff, expertise, facilities available within and outside of the school community expectations. So, by this provides a mechanism making possible a study plan and organized in advance. If it is well organized, it may permit greater flexibility in organizing the use of time of students and teachers. So, are they optimal in terms of students learning the content? So, learning content is broadly defined as the topics, themes, beliefs, behaviors, concepts, and facts, often grouped within each subject of learning area under knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes that are expected to be learned and form the basis of teaching and learning. Other one is are they capable of allowing students to develop their skills, thinking, and rational powers? So, allowing their ability to think clearly and rationally about what to do or what to believe, it includes the ability to engage in reflective and independent thinking. So, the next one is, are they capable of stimulating in students' greater understanding of their own existence as individuals and as a member of the groups. So, it should be seen as a very important factor in 
the learning. The motivated students has the inner strength to learn, to discover, and capitalize on capabilities to improve academic performance and to adopt to the demands of the school context. So, the next one again is, are they capable of fostering in students an openness to new experiences and a tolerance for diversity? It is important for a teacher to reflect on diversity because if a student feels like the teacher wants to learn about their culture, that they will feel accepted by their teacher. As students, culture is a part of students' life or personality. When working and learning with people from a variety of backgrounds and cultures present in the classroom, students gain a more comprehensive understanding of the subject matter. Let's have another one. <laughs> so, are they such that they will facilitate learning and motivate students to continue learning? So, it determines the specific goals toward which people strive. Those, it affects the choices students make. So, when we talk about motivation, it will definitely increase students' time and task and it also an important factor affecting their learning and achievements. So, also, motivation enhances cognitive processing. So, let's have another one. Are they capable of allowing students to address their needs? So, identifying and meeting individual learner needs both their moral and encourages them. In addition to communicate to students that well believe they can whatever they set their minds to, there are several factors that need to be in place for positive expectations to translate into reality. Now, let's have the second to the last criteria of selecting experiences. So, are they that students broaden their interest? So, when we talk about interest, is a powerful motivational process that energizes learning, guide academic and career trajectories, and it is essential to academic success. So, promoting interest can contribute to a more engaged, motivated learning experience for students. Now, let's have the last one. So, are they such that they will foster the total development of students when it comes to cognitive, affective, psychomotor, social, and spiritual domains? So, one important aspect to make students' learning valuable is to focus the planning and setting objectives in terms of desired outcomes, the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, the values that we want our students to develop. By developing clear objectives, students feel that there is a reason for learning. Now, let's bound to the curriculum content. So when you talk about it, it simplify means the totality of what is to be thought in school system. The content component of teaching learning situations refers to the important principles, facts, and concepts that to be thought. So now, let's bound to criteria for selecting content. So what will lead to student self-sufficiency? So when you talk about self-sufficiency, people have a strong internal locus of control. That is, they have the ability and the desire to determine their own course, to make their own decisions, rather than having their life choices made by others. What is significant? When we talk about significant, it means important or influential in a child's life and may include a family member or close friend or the quality of being worthy of attention. Importance. The meaning to be found in words are event. Now, let's lead to the two definitions of significance. Number one, having or conveying a meaning, expressive, suggesting, or implying deeper or unstated meaning. Number two, important, notable, consequential, or what is valid, authentic, true. What is interesting? Note for this, students may not even know his own interest. What is useful? What is learning? 
what is feasible. Now, let's have the third detailer rationally. So, how can educational experiences be organized? When we talk about organization of educational experience is to produce a cumulative effect. They must be organized that they reinforce each other. Relationships of educational experiences can be examined over time and from one area to another relationships are vertical when you compare two of the same courses but from different grade levels. Relationships also are horizontal when you compare two different courses from different grade levels. So everyone, there are three criteria that need to be met when you are trying to build an effectively organized group of learning experiences. First one is the continuity, refers to the vertical reiteration of major curricular elements. Reading social studies materials continued up through higher grade. The second one is sequence, refers to experiences that built upon preceding elements but in more brief and detail. Sequence also emphasizes higher level of treatment. Also, a criterion emphasizing the importance of having each successive experience build upon the preceding one but to go more broadly and deeper it into the matters involved. The last one is the integration. Unified view of things, solving problems in arithmetic as well as in another disciplines, or which the horizontal relationship of curriculum experiences. We aim for educational effectiveness and efficiency. Must institutionalized education is must education. We want to be able to teach groups. Most education is departmentalized because we expect someone trained in a specific topic to be more likely to be able to teach the topic. Generally, we arrange educational experiences from easiest to hardest and from most general to. So, at this point, allow me to give you to Miss Leia Waskin to give another bunch of learnings. So moving on to number four, how can we determine whether these purposes are being attained? As you can see on the screen, there is an image or diagram there that summarizes the steps of the Tyler model. The Tyler model is one of the best known models for curriculum development, known for the special attention it gives to the planning phases. Well, Tyler recommends that curriculum planners that identify general or tentative objectives by gathering data from three sources. So we have the learners or the students or the society or the contemporary life outside the school and subject matter. So after identifying numerous tentative objectives, the planners redefine them by filtering them through the two screens. So we have the philosophical and psychological screen. For the philosophical screen, Tyler advised teachers of a particular schools to formulate educational and social philosophy to outline values by emphasizing four democratic goals. So what is what are these democratic goals? So first is the recognition of every individual as a human being regardless of his race, national, social, and economic status. Second is opportunity for wide participation in all phases of activities in school groups in the society. Yeah. And the third is the encouragement of variability rather than demanding a single type of personality. And last is faith and intelligence as a method of dealing them with important problems rather than depending upon the authority of an autocratic or aristocratic group. So moving on to psychological screen, the teachers must clarify the principles of learning that they believe to be sound. A psychology of learning as emphasized by Tyler not only includes specific and definite findings, but a unified formulation of theory of learning which helps to outline the nature of learning process, how it takes place, under what conditions, and what sort of mechanism and the like. And then organizing learning experiences or selected learning experiences in order to have a maximum cumulative effect. And lastly is the evaluation or evaluating the curriculum and revising those aspects that did not prove to be effective. So we are done with Tyler's model. Then let's move on on Helda Taba, the grassroots approach. Helda Taba is a curriculum theorist 
a curriculum reformer, and a teacher educator. The Tabas model is also known as the grassroots approach, based on the rationale that those who teach the curriculum, that is the teacher, should participate in developing the curriculum. So Taba introduced seven most important steps as follows. First is diagnosis of needs. First things first, there is a need to find the requirements of the learners before designing the curriculum. Second is formulation of objectives. After identifying goals, so those goals are required to be accomplished by the teachers. Third is selection of contents. So the contents and objective should not only correspond to one another, but also valid and significant. Fourth is organization of contents. According to the interest of the children, the content should be categorized by considering the maturity, understanding, and interest of the learners. Fifth is selection of the learning experiences. Those methods of instruction should be selected which engage the learners with the contents. And number six is organization of learning activities. So besides the content sequence and organization, learning activities should also be categorized so that learners can link the activities with the contents as well as to remember what they have learned. And lastly, number seven is evaluation. The curriculum planners also need to determine the accomplishment of the objectives. So in the process of evaluation, both the teachers and the students are involved. So Taba also wanted teachers to be the primary curriculum developers. Her advocacy was called the grassroots approach. In the perspective of Taba's model, teachers are the most important factor in the curriculum building. A teacher should participate in the curriculum from the beginning to the end by shifting the responsibility more to teachers rather than administrator. So it makes Taba's model different and more realistic. So the views of Hilda's Taba's curriculum development model are used in many schools' curriculums nowadays. So we are through with the Taba's model. Then let's move on to Galin Selor and William Alexander, which has four steps. Curriculum is a plan for providing sets of learning opportunities to achieve broad educational goals and related specific objectives for an identifiable population served by a single school centers. So first step is the goals, objectives, and domains. Curriculum planners begin by specifying the major educational goals and specific objectives they wish to accomplish. Each major goal represents a curriculum domain, so the personal development, human relations, continued learning skills, and specializations. So the goals, objectives, and domains are identified and chosen based on research findings, accreditation standards, and views of the different stakeholders. So once the goals, objectives, and domains have been established, planners move into the process of designing. So here, decision is made in the appropriate learning opportunities for each domain and how and when these opportunities will be provided. So the step two is curriculum designing. Designing of a curriculum follows where appropriate learning opportunities are determined and how each opportunity is provided. So here are some of the questions that need to be answered at this stage of development process. So will the curriculum be designed along the lines of academic disciplines or according to student needs and interests or along themes? So curriculum design involves decisions made by the responsible curriculum planning groups for a particular school center and student populations. So the design plan ultimately anticipates the entire range of learning opportunities for a specified population. And then step number three is curriculum implementations. So a design curriculum is not ready for implementation. Teachers then prepare instructional plans where instructional objectives are specified and appropriate teaching methods and strategies are utilized to achieve the desired learning outcomes among students. Curriculum implementations involves decisions regarding instruction. Various teaching strategies are included in the curriculum so that teachers have options. Instruction is thus the implementation of the curriculum plan. There is no reason for developing curriculum so there is no reason for developing curriculum plans if there is no instruction. Curriculum plans by their very nature are efforts to guide and direct the nature and character of learning opportunities in which students participate. So all curriculum planning is worthless unless 
it influences the things that students do in school. Sigler argues that curriculum planners must see in instruction and teaching as the summation of their efforts. And last step is evaluation. So, a comprehensive evaluation using a variety of evaluation techniques is recommended. It should involve the total educational program of the school and the curriculum plan, the effectiveness of instruction and achievement of the students. Through the evaluation process, curriculum planner and developers can determine whether or not the goals of the schools and the objectives of instruction have been met. For the curriculum evaluation, it involves the process of evaluating expected learning outcomes and the entire curriculum plan. Sailor and his colleagues recognize both formative and summative evaluation. So for formative evaluation, we have the feedback arrangements that enable the curriculum planners to make adjustments and improvements at every stage of the curriculum development process. So we have the goals, the domains and objectives, curriculum designing, and curriculum implementations. And for the summative evaluation, comes at the end of the process and deals with the evaluation of the total curriculum plan. So this evaluation becomes feedback for curriculum developers to use in deciding whether to continue, modify, or eliminate the curriculum plan with another student population. So the provision of systematic feedback during each step in the curriculum system and from students in each instructional situation constitutes a major contribution to Sailor and Associates administrative model of curriculum development. So that was the process and models of curriculum. For your assessment, which is the suggested learning activity, we have here the tabular presentation. All you have to do is to complete the table by reviewing the best features of the different curriculum development process and models you've learned on our discussion and also give your insights for each model. So that's it. I hope you learned something from this video. So thank you for watching.